talk about testing. Oh, yeah. So I'll be repeating questions if I forget to repeat questions, or Mike does, mind us, because it's so annoying. Person asked, and I'm just um, Is that all? Okay. Cool. So we are here today, Mike and I, to take you on a journey. Um, so I want to take the parable of the software development team. Developers, QA engineers, but they've never worked together. So the whole lab is loving the teacher, but some of the teacher started to create some very software driven sales and we can't cover every line of the application because it takes all day. A beautiful test coverage report that, even though you can't see it on the screen, is a lovely shade of green. Every line by you. Every function, every directory, and developers are trying to find comfort. Everything that has to be done. The QA engineers on the team have their own set of equally thoughtfully written thorough tests. Um, these tests are run regularly and ensure that bugs are being found before they make their way. It's a beautiful, intricate, delicate machine. And it works. So great. At this point, the facade crumbles, and the beauty of this machine turns into a nightmare. In addition of a few new features, the team begins to feel like a team. This thorough unit test is a lab that is so thought out, and it takes so much time building. But it seems to be really expensive to maintain. Automated tests written by QA engineers, well, they go in and they take multiple hours to run. You have to run them overnight. And it typically they fail in the morning for no reason, and they're completely looking at the next morning to see if they fail. And because they're not using the full compressed line, they have to abstract it away to make it nearly impossible to do that. And the end result of this hours long overnight test. Spoiler alert, this hypothetical scene is actually a year ago. And we <laughs> dug ourselves quite a hole. And our hope today is that we can make our team a little bit easier. So that's why Mike and I are here with you. We are going to share with you six lessons that we learned from our adventure and our journey to QAing the team. There is no blood. There Of our team story and where we end up today. So, lesson one, redefine the unit of work. The first lesson we learned from our developers was that we really need to step back and reevaluate ourselves in regard to our unit tests. Um, so there are lots of definitions of unit tests, and this is one that we like quite a lot. Uh, a unit test is a piece of code that invokes a unit of work in the system and then checks a single assumption about the behavior of that unit of work. It's really straightforward, except like, what is a unit? What constitutes a unit? Depending on how you define that, that could be as small as a variable declaration, or as large as an entire in-app workflow. Most things in life, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And in our case, well, we decided to define a unit in the beginning, 
single function or method. It just seemed like a very clean way to split it. So let's imagine for a moment, I think you sometimes like to have analogies. Let's imagine that our application design team write some tests to verify that when a user puts on a pedal, it's a certain behavior of their pedal. And I drew this link right here to which the pedal in our early days, we would have, of course, produced a print and a contained many years of information field, two separate sets of tests. In our code, that would be represented by all these different entries. So here you see how the tests are made. But then and then moving the chain does some stuff and it makes a wheel. So writing a test for moving chain, have a single assertion on it. By And then we start that it should move the chain. Can I apply this? Apply chain change. Can I confirm it moves chain by the code code? Code code. There we go. And if we change on the container call for our move chain function, we confirm that it has accurately moved the chain. Wonderful. But then we decide that we want to upgrade this value to string and we write a one of our sets. So let's get a line that comes in the middle there. We now call intern crank this add electron. And then maybe also we just didn't like move chain in the other part quickly enough, so we call it push add electron. Great enhancement. Um, and so when we do this, we have kind of a sad part of our code. Both of our tests have broken. But why? Like why do our tests have broken? Turning the crank eventually does make it back here, but we've added this unit that can't come out right. We can add some unit tests and pull that certain chunk of the string right here and update it to those tests. And so we just do these three to set those iterations. We do a very clean fit, it's pretty frustrating as a developer. You know, just add a chunk of mod and then just write a bunch of other. Really beautiful title. By a guy named Roy Ostrom. Um, and in the split, he gives his developer three choices of whether they should redefine the user interface. Um, and he gives this definition, I think, very helpful. He says, a unit board can contain a single method, a class, or multiple classes, working together to execute one single logical purpose with the user interface. your world for what it is you're trying to work through. So our final test, remember we started that the crank, um, when we turn the crank, the pedal, the chain moves. But in truth, what pedal will the stack be working on? The isn't really clear. In our case, one single logical purpose is really that you put Break up our code to be used with other tests. It's really frustrating to have to get your arms kind of tied in knots. And so we need to step back and evaluate what it is we're trying to accomplish. And so we call this together a unit. Um, but maybe doing that helps you make a good function. But we also are looking at a broader picture. So our tests have been broke. We had been using this unit of work all along. Well, we still would have probably written a test, but that test would have <coughs> had goal with these functions together. Crank <coughs> should move the wheel. We don't care about what the chain does. Um, that's not particularly important in this case. What we really care about is we're executing one single logical purpose. So we write this test, and then we go through and we upgrade some in guys. But way back test still passes. style of testing. We've started writing tests this way in our newer components. There's a marked difference um, in the ability of our tests. 
And the interesting thing is that rewriting tests in this way um, goes hand in hand with connecting more to your users. So I am going to pass this over to Mike to explain. Uh, so the second thing we learned is that it's a good idea to write user-centered tests. Um, and before I dive into that too deeply, I just want to talk about tests in general and why we write tests at all. So the end result of everything we do as developers and engineers is for you, whether you're a user in a, another developer because you're writing a library, in the general public, or an app, or some user in business because they need it to do their job. All of our software um, has users and the ultimate goal of every application we build. Um, and sometimes we have a frustrating relationship with our users because they do unexpected things and we get bugs generated that shouldn't really be bugs. Um, sometimes we consider ourselves to be users is not always the case. I write security software, but I'm not a security analyst. So sometimes they have some different thoughts than I do. Um, but still, it's always important that we follow the practice of empathetic development, where we give our users the best possible experience that they can have. And that means instead of merely meeting the basic requirements of what they need, we go beyond those requirements um, and we make sure that we meet their needs the best possible way. We want to make the tasks that they're trying to do with our software as easy as possible. And so although it's a little counterintuitive, we, our tests are actually for our users as well, uh, which might seem strange because our users never see our tests. They don't uh, see the output of those tests. They don't know that the tests exist. So how could those tests be for our users? Well, the users can tell the difference between a poorly tested application and a well <coughs> Because if your application is poorly tested, it means it's more likely to have bugs that are going to be frustrating to the user. It's going to take them longer to get whatever task they're working on completed. And just overall, they won't really like using your software. Um, whereas if your application is well tested, uh, it's going to be a polished, pleasant, and a delightful experience for your users. Where they won't get frustrated and they don't have to like think about your software too much. Which is actually So we want to be user-centered, but what is actually the real problem with non-user-centered tests? Well, uh, in the case I'm going to show you in a second here, it's possible for all of your tests to be passing, and all of those tests to be validating good things, to have 100% code coverage, and yet nothing in your application is actually working. It's a huge problem as a user. Uh, so let's look at an example. Uh, so I've got a very simple application. About as simple as you can get. So we've got a counter, the counter is set to zero. We've got a button right below that says plus one. I want to be able to click on this plus one button and have the counter increment from zero to one. And then from one to two, and so on. So I've written a uh, small React application uh, to do this. And if you don't know React, that's totally okay. It's the same concept applies regardless of technology. Um, and so we have this. And it's pretty simple. We have this state variable uh, where uh, we have a count of zero. That's what we're starting with. We have a method in this class that increments our count, which is the state to be count plus one. We go from zero to one. And then we have render for what we put on the page, which is that counter where we put an inherent counter value. We have this increment button where it's, we'll call that increment count. So pretty simple. Uh, we've also written a bunch of tests for this as well. So here is the majority of the tests that we have. Um, so for our counter test, we have three main tests here. First of all, we're making sure that it renders uh, without crashing, because we don't want to crash. Uh, for that button that we have there, we're making sure that we pass the increment count function to that button, so that when we click on it, it'll be called. Uh, and then lastly, we pass that increment count function as well make sure that uh, when it's called, it increases the count by one, so from zero to one. So let's run those tests and make sure that they're all working. I'll run that coverage report as well, because I have a great coverage as well. All right, so all of our tests are passing. 
can see we have 100% code coverage. So everything looks pretty good. We think we're in a pretty good spot. Let's go back to our application and actually click on the Scorecard button. Suddenly we have this huge error. User sees the user application fundamentally broken. And our tests haven't told us anything about this. From what we can tell from our tests, like everything is fine. But obviously it's not. Uh, so, maybe we can improve it. So yes, obviously our tests have failed us, but what can we actually do to fix them? What are some things that we can focus on? Um, so first of all, uh, the old way we were writing tests is we wrote a test for each function, like regardless of whether it was a reusable function, or called other functions, or just utility function. Um, every, every single function had at least one test for it, and probably multiple. Um, and that can be good in some cases, but in general, uh, you for sure should have a test for each user action. You can see in the test that we had there, we weren't actually focusing on a user action at all. Um, our old test did a lot of mocking because we had to test each function in isolation, and that meant if it called five different other functions, we had to mock out all those, the return values of all those five other functions. Um, so we just had kind of like mocking overload. Uh, so instead of doing that, um, expand your unit of work and then just mock things that are in your global state or things that exist outside of that component. Um, another thing that was very common for us was to be validating an internal state. And you saw that we did this in some of the tests there where we called a function and we made sure internal state was updated. I wanted to make sure that count state variable changed from zero to one. Um, and that can be nice, but really that doesn't matter to the user because the user only knows that something's happened when the text on the page has changed. So we want to be validating output as it's perceived by the user. And lastly, this kind of goes hand in hand with the mocking, but our old test just had a lot of better code. We would have to mock a whole bunch of different things. We would have to like <coughs> shallow render multiple components. And overall, the tests are just not very readable at all. And a good sign that you're doing things right is if your test is very short and it's very easy to read. Basically, you should be rendering your components. You should be uh, doing a bunch of user actions and maybe one user action. Um, and at the end, you would validate something that's very straightforward way to fill your tests. So knowing this, let's go back to our example um, and make things a little bit better. So save us some time here. I've actually already written out a new test for us in advance. But we were skipping it before, so it wasn't. Uh, so now we have one test because there's only one action that can happen um, in our application. So it's already helping me out here. Um, so our test is that it should be incrementing the counter when the button is pressed. Pressing the button, we expect that zero to go to zero one. So the first thing we do is we render the app. Most of the time we wouldn't render your whole application. In this case, it's a very simple application, so it's okay. Um, then you would, we're doing a click on the element with the text of plus one. It'll find the element on the page that has that plus one text, which is our button. We'll click on and we have our expectation. Uh, we're getting an element by test ID of counter because in the content that we're rendering, we have this data test ID to make sure we can select it in the test. Um, and then we're expecting that to have a text content of counter colon one. It starts out with zero, so after the button is clicked, it should be one. So let's run this and again and see what happens. Now no longer skipping this test, so it should be okay for you. Uh, we've got a failure here, so I would hazard a guess that it's the new one we've added. Yep, so it's saying it was counter zero when it should have been counter one. Uh, and if we scroll up far enough through this humongous stack trace, you can see we got type error, not read property, set state of undefined. If we go back to the application, There we go, okay. Um, so you can see this is the exact same error that we saw in our test. Uh, so it cannot reset state of undefined. 
So by writing this new user-focused test, we've seen exactly what the user can see, and we know that there's a problem in our application. Not only that, but this is going to help us fix that issue. So if we go back to our application, and uh, <coughs> after doing some digging, I found the source of this issue. Uh, when we pass this increment count to the on click, our this is being reassigned. So this doesn't actually indicate this class. It has to do with the event that's being called. So using some modern JavaScript syntax, I can change this to an arrow function. Uh, and it will make sure my this is bound correctly, and it's always pointing at this point, so I don't have to worry about that problem anymore. Well, let's rerun the test and uh, see if that's made a difference. All right, you can see our test is passing now, so everything's looking good. Uh, let's go to the application and double check this. All right, so now let's click on the button. When it increases to one, we don't get the error. Keep clicking on that and it continues to work. You can see just by adding this one task that's a lot more user focused, uh, we've been able to see an issue that our users are seeing. We've been able to fix it and know right away that we fixed the problem without even looking at the application. Um, so the tool that we used uh, for this test is called React Testing Library. It's part of this suite of products called Testing Library. Um, and it's pretty awesome because it really holds your hand in writing these user-focused tests. Because it thing, does things like, it doesn't even allow you to look at internal state of a component. You have to look at things as they're perceived by the user. Um, and even if you're not using React, that's fine, because they have a version of this library for most of the major frameworks. So Angular, Vue.js, they've got versions for this. Um, so definitely check this out if you like this testing philosophy. You can read a lot more about it at this URL. Um, I won't dig into any more detail with it, but definitely give it a look on your time. So we've really been focusing at the unit test level so far, uh, but there's a lot of other kinds of tests you can write as well. Uh, so let's see what Lance has to say about those. So the third to explore other testing layers, and let me explain that a bit. We first began to show you two levels of tests, so levels, if you will, where we could perform front-end tests for application. There was the unit test level. Um, so if you remember in our bike example, the unit test, if we redefine the unit of work, would just confirm that pushing on the pedals of the crank actually turned the back wheel. We had the unit test level. I'm going to take a minute to look at the differences more closely. With unit tests, we're looking at one unit of work, which we've already defined. And all of those tests are reading our components. Usually three components, I'd say, would be a pretty good amount. Um, but there are ones that do. Um, and they would be reading those in a virtual DOM, so not in a real browser. Um, that's fine. It actually works for most cases. But it's a pretty fake environment. So there's In the unit tests, on the other hand, render your entire all of your back-end services, your API that your application uses, um, and it puts it all there together. And the nice thing about these tests is that they are rendering your application exactly the way the user would experience it with you. And in seeing that, it's really nice to use tests really realistic, and that they're user-focused, and they're emulated in the environment. You can kind of wonder more about it and say, oh, yeah, I can really do this really well. I can learn about that, and I can see it in that. is, is my team wants to useful experience, is that over the impact of making the viewer feel comfortable. What was it that you wanted? User-centered tests in a real environment where they belong. And if those do not have the cost of those goals, then it feels kind of empty. It feels empty. Um, it feels hours to <coughs> all those tests to run. Um, just the way your user is interested. Even if those tests work, you can see yourself getting to very close. You can use them to see how environments are designed to see where they start to. So you're often in a way just scrolling. Times out. You don't have to figure out the gap. It is hours to do work. And you don't have to have a ton of experience to see how that works. And that's the first really nice thing about this. And the IDs should be able to do this on every level. I know we don't want to do everything at every end level, but 
Listen to what I have. Is anybody going to be familiar with the concept of a pyramid? Um, this is what ours looked like in the beginning. We'll lump all the lead pieces up in the top of it, and that's what I wrote down here. Um, the key in the gem is that you want to have more of the things on the bottom, fewer of the things on top. And you add the second pyramid to help it lower and more expensive to build. Um, ideally, the main thing is you can use these tests to the lowest feasible layer of lead. I have that in my notes. Um, we're using the as we've already discussed, um, but it's important to keep in mind. Um, the main problem with our test pyramid was that it doesn't really look like a pyramid at all. It doesn't look like a pyramid at all. Um, we had a very um, challenging time keeping it. Um, you may need to take those down, but other options are there. Well, it turns out that there are two other levels that you're going to have to know. Um, they are the system test and the service test. unit of Of our that could be pushed to this level. Testing. As um, your front end with everything else stubbed out. Services. And stop. So as of our unit of work, of our crank. Um, we want to stub out the frame. We don't really care about that. We stub out the ceiling. Not useful. And we just work reciprocally and take care of the whole lead off of it and put it back together. Um, your model is that. Definitely slow than your unit test. Unit test is way faster than your service test. Um, and they're moderately cheap. They have a real dome, which is a huge benefit. There's a great um, open source library out there. Cyclic is one that we use. We also use Puppeteer. I think we'll teach you some fancy stuff on top of that. I think there was a talk about earlier today. Um, system tests are very helpful because there's lots of stuff that we were doing in end-to-end -end that we could just shut down again. The third level kind of in the middle here is the service level. So for um, service tests, you take your whole web application, everything that you have about it, and you have three services, one that your team maintains, and then you stub out everything else. For us, with bike, maybe this is taking the whole bike we built, but putting it up on a track. It's a really fancy track. It's turns, the wheel, the springs, and everything it all works. But we've stubbed out the first part of the API for cranes, and roads, and, and doors, and any of that other stuff. Um, and we are just looking at the parts that we built. Um, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, still cheaper than end-to-end -end testing. And you can, again, use Some teams use Selenium. Last one is the end-to-end -end test, which you just want to try and have as few as possible. It's a root web app, it's your whole application, it's part of your API, along with some further appendages that your application interacts with. Um, for us, is putting that robot on the bike, and sending it out into the world, and seeing how that test goes. They're going to be slower and expensive, but they definitely help us get new features and contracts that are constructed. So that all 
process was. Focus a little bit. Fourth lesson we learned is that you should be testing everything somewhere, but that doesn't mean you should test everything everywhere. So we just looked at that big test pyramid. Obviously, if you tested everything everywhere, it wouldn't be a pyramid. It would be kind of like a square. It's not what you want. Um, and what happened on our team where we ran into problems is that when our team was first formed, it was a brand new team. Caitlin mentioned we worked on this new application. We all sat together in the same area in the office. We were all very friendly with each other. You wouldn't actually think that there were any walls between any of us, uh, but there actually was this hidden wall that existed between the engineers and the QA members of our team. So what would happen is the engineers on our team, they would build their feature that they're working on. They would write some unit tests to make sure that they, they built it correctly to their satisfaction. When they're done with it, they would like take that feature, they just kind of like tuck it over the wall and somebody on the other end it was their turn with it, and they would take it and they would uh, they would write a test plan for it, and they would like test it really well, make sure there weren't any bugs. If there were bugs, so they would say, "Oh, this is the engineer's problem." Uh, they would take it back and they chuck it back over the wall to the engineer. Like, you go and fix the bug. Um, so everybody clearly understood their own responsibilities. They each had kind of a piece of it, um, but we weren't very unified uh, doing that. And this kind of worked uh, similarly to packing for a trip with a friend or a partner, except neither of you is talking to each other. And that means that you're both going to pack your own tube of toothpaste, your own tube of sunscreen. <coughs> you're going to pack a whole bunch of things that you actually could have shared and you may not even end up using. Uh, and you'll duplicate a whole bunch of stuff and be bringing more with you than you, than you would ever possibly need. Um, and that's kind of a pain to bring you with you on the trip. But if you do things right, there's exactly one of everything that you need. You can fix a lot more cleanly instead of duplicating a whole bunch of stuff. And you have a lot less to take with you on your trip, which is much more meaningful. Um, so we really discovered that duplicating test effort uh, leads to test bloat, and that leads to a maintenance nightmare. Uh, so at testing, you know, we had a great idea by testing a lot of things, but the problem was it, it just wasn't <coughs> took two things to, to break down that wall machine and to get us cooperating a little bit better. Uh, so the first thing is that we realized that uh, quality is everybody's responsibility. Um, so initially, QA was, sought, uh, was thought to be the holders of quality. They were the last line of defense. They had to make sure that bugs didn't escape to users. Um, and dev kind of did like the bare minimum that they had to do. It was really QA's job to make sure that we had a high quality application. Uh, and so we had to shift that and we realized that all of us are responsible for quality. We all need to do a, uh, a part in that in order for it to actually happen. And in order for us to actually achieve that quality, we actually had to talk to each other. So instead of being siloed off and kind of each doing our own thing and having our own part to play, we actually kind of had to come together and have a conversation and work out a strategy with everything that we built. Um, and that was initially a little bit hard because it also meant that we had to trust each other. It meant that uh, developers would be writing tests that uh, QA might not be familiar with, um, but we still believed those unit tests that we were writing would cover the same functionality that the test QA were writing. And that was a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and how all of this process ended up working out on our team is that when we started working on a new feature, um, two things would happen. So uh, developers would go and start coding it, you know, just as they always had. But then also QA would start a test strategy plan. And they would fill up this document saying, like, here are all of the cases we want to cover. And once they had completed that, they would meet with the developer and they, the two of them would go over it together. They'd say, okay, like, we need to cover all of this. The developer would say, hey, I think like, all of this stuff is coverable via unit tests, and I can take those. And QA would say, OK, well, I think this stuff makes sense in our end-to-end tests, and, and I'm comfortable writing that. And each of them would divide up the work. And so we each kind of shared the workload and the burden of making sure that things were well tested. Um, so then going forward from that, every test that we wrote, we thought about how did this fit into the 
overall plan that we had. Um, you had to be aware of everything else uh, that is in your, uh, all of the tests that you have, because you didn't want to be duplicating what you already had, or you just end up bloating things and duplicating things all over the place. So remember from earlier, we kind of ended up with this robot that it had a good purpose of serving as breakfast, but it really was not doing a very good job at it. it was uh, well, instead, we refine this down to this automatic cereal dispenser, where, sure, it doesn't deliver cereal directly into my mouth, but I am very confident that I can get a perfect bowl of cereal every time. Um, so what this means for our tests and our application is that, one, we no longer need somebody on the team dedicated to fixing tests. So once upon a time, somebody's full-time job was fixing all the broken tests because they kept breaking. Uh, code changes no longer trigger an avalanche of broken tests. So every time you make almost any change, you get like 30 to 50 failed unit tests that you have to update. It can take a lot of time to work through that. Our tests run faster, so they used to take two hours, and they would run overnight. Um, and we minimize that down to 10 minutes. So everything we have, we feel like we've covered everything pretty well. All that's done in 10 minutes, just from like reducing a lot of the duplication and shifting things around on that test pyramid. And all that ultimately means is that we can now deliver features faster to our users, um, and we can have confidence in the changes that we're making. Because we know that if those tests are passing, users are very unlikely to be seeing bugs. We've covered all the major things. Um, so we can push those out to production and do that multiple times a week, um, and things go pretty well. So we've made a lot of progress on our team, but we haven't figured out everything. And there's a few things that are still exploring and trying to learn more about. So the first thing is we build an accessible application. Uh, we want to make sure our application is usable by everybody, even if you have disabilities or other needs. Um, and we don't have a good those accessibility requirements. So we want a good pragmatic way for validating that. Um, the other thing is that there can be some trade-offs between being accurate to the user experience and having a test that performs really so it might be a good test to type in 10,000 characters into your text field, but <coughs> simulating 10,000 prefresses, uh, even at the unit test level, can take a little bit of time. If you do that a lot, it definitely adds up. So we'd like to have some guidelines around um, how to break this balance the best. And of course, we've been learning and evolving over time. And we have a bunch of old tests that uh, still need to be cleaned up, and it'll take us time to do all of that. I think that's okay. You can move to this model progressively. Uh, so if there's anything you can take away from this talk, really just remember these four things. So first of all, um, redefine a unit of work. Uh, it doesn't have to be the smallest possible unit you can think of. Um, write user-centered tests. Making, make sure you're covering those user flows in your application um, and uh, so that you're seeing those bugs that you, your users might be seeing. Third, utilize every layer of that test pyramid. Rather than just focusing everything at the bottom or everything at the top or somewhere in between that, uh, distribute it as best you can evenly throughout that pyramid such that you have the least at the top. Um, and then lastly, uh, test everything somewhere. Don't test it everywhere uh, because duplicating those tests will definitely increase the amount of time it takes to run and it'll just make it much harder to maintain. So hopefully this was helpful to you. Definitely, if you have questions for us, we're, we're happy to talk with you afterwards. We'll shake up here for a little while.